Welcome to Dreamforce, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause for making it in the room. <laughs> We're so excited about the turnout and the interest in this subject. Uh, what a great way to start Dreamforce to, than to talk about APIs. Um, my name is Chris Harrison. I'm not the host of The Bachelor. I'm a product manager at Salesforce. Uh, I've been with the Enterprise API team and Iman for the last five months after spending a number of years in the API space. Hey guys, I'm Iman Barkadarian. I'm an engineer on the API team for the last two and a half years. Been working on a number of the different APIs we'll be talking about in this presentation. Just from a show of hands, how many people's first session is this at Dreamforce? All right. All right, that's a good turnout. So I'm honored to pre present to you our famous forward-looking statement slide. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna read it word for word. Main idea is we're gonna be presenting a lot of stuff uh, of our roadmap, forward-looking, and we urge you that you make any type of product purchasing decisions based on what's currently available today. That's a short-winded. <laughs> Thanks for keeping it brief, Iman. Thank you, Chris. So here's our agenda. We're going to briefly explore the Salesforce API landscape. After covering that and supporting resources, we'll talk about a framework that you can incorporate into the planning of your integrations with the Salesforce platform and hopefully give you some more tools about how to more effectively make use of all this platform capability. We'll then make use of the forward-looking statement and. Uh, shed some light on some capabilities that we're working on in the future. So let's get started. So what we see here is Salesforce offers a number of different APIs and workflows to help you get set up with your integration. There's a number of different APIs, and this is actually just a subset of them. Einstein scoring, we got, and uh, even more beyond that. But I actually want to focus on what Enterprise API is specifically focused on, which is programmatic access to your Salesforce data, the enterprise APIs, which is on the left side right here. As you can see, we have SOAP, we have custom APIs. You're able to actually create your own Apex web services to be API endpoints you can call into. We have bulk APIs that allow you to work with millions upon millions of records, whether you wanna insert into your org or extract it, and obviously, our REST APIs. So speaking of REST, there are actually 41 top-level resources that you'll see if you hit this get endpoint. Now that's a lot of capability, and the specific capabilities that are available to you will, of course, vary depending on the org edition that you're working with, the licenses that are assigned and provisioned, the object customizations you have present within your org, and the version of the API that you're working with. I've been exploring this uh, set of resources extensively over the last few months since I joined uh, Salesforce. And as a rookie to Salesforce, I've had the very special benefit of leaning on Iman and the engineering team to answer my questions and to help me get unblocked when I have um, an impediment before me. But Iman has a day job. He's building more capabilities on this platform, which is what he should be doing, and he doesn't have time to answer all my questions. Just for the record, though, I have enjoyed every step of it. I have two, Iman, you're okay. great. Um, but I'd rather you be coding. Um, thankfully, Salesforce offers uh, an extensive uh, suite of resources to help everyone discover and make use of this API landscape. There's our developer guide that is rich with quick starts and examples. The enterprise API products that Eamon and I cover have over 1,600 topics that are featured on the developer guide. And this resource is supplemented with a help website, with various best practices posts, with blogs. We, of course, have trailhead modules that focus on APIs. There are videos and demonstrations from events from the past. And it's all brought together in a wonderful portal, the Salesforce Integration and API Center, which is a great place to go for immediate access to all these resources. Now, with all of this API capability and with this volume of supporting resources, 
it's possible for somebody to get lost when onboarding with the platform anew like I have over the last few months, or when you're revisiting the platform to build a new integration. There's just a lot of stuff to manage through. And in order to be effective at planning and building your integration, you need some help. Um, and we're here to provide a little bit of that assistance. ALM, Application Lifecycle Management. This is the process you're gonna go through when you wanna build any app. It starts with planning, and there's coding, merge and testing, test and release. It's an involved process. Now, where it starts is at the planning phase. And like Chris had mentioned, there are a number of different resources and a number of different directions you can decide to go through in your integration implementation step. So we wanna just take a step back for a sec and start looking at why you choose certain resources and how dangerous it could be that maybe if you didn't think about certain considerations, an incorrect planning step could have you incur certain costs to switch down the road when you realize it's maybe too late. For instance, let's say you want to, an example scenario, you had 150,000 products you wanted to insert into your account, into your org. So you think about, you look at what, how do you want to plan it? You look online and you see, oh, the REST API would be a great place to start. I'm familiar with REST. So you start inserting these products one at a time. All of a sudden, you get back an error code saying, limit exceeded. And you look and you notice, oh, I have, okay, I have 15,000 API requests a day. I'm, I'm only 15,000 of my 150,000 records in, and I haven't even completed this process. Maybe this wasn't the greatest way to go about it. Oh, and I have to get this done in two days. That's my SLA. So then you start digging a little bit more into the portal that Chris had mentioned, and you see, oh, there's bulk API. So obviously REST was a little too small for this operation. Bulk lets you do this with many records at a time. You can work up to the millions of records. So you look at the developer guide and you see, oh, there's this job you can create, and you create these batches, and then there's a different limit with batches, and you realize this is, this is way too much. This is really involved. I'm just dealing with 150,000. So maybe that wasn't the right plan. So then you look and you notice that Actually, the Enterprise API has extended the composite API to have a collections API that lets you insert 200 records at a time synchronously, kind of a middle ground between the two that we described. And you'll actually get your job done in a matter of just a couple hundred requests, and you should be fine. So that's just one example of how, if you just pick the first option you see, you might not always be set up as appropriately as you'd imagine, you'd want to be. So in order to be more effective at planning out your path to building an integration, being more effective at writing code, we present this framework for everyone to exercise, which is to help you match up with the right APIs for the right job. These are some factors to consider when determining which of the APIs that are available to you on this platform to use, that best satisfy your use case, that best meet your end user's needs, and also account for some other considerations that are going to come into play with your integration. Now our team uh, builds a lot of API capability and they're all designed and built to support a given set of use cases. There's a lot of overlap across this API landscape. And so it's helpful to consider where these overlaps are going to come into play by teasing out these different uh, aspects of your integration. And we're gonna work through them one by one. So first up is the user experience. Um, I'm a product manager and I'm conditioned to ask the question, what problem am I trying to solve? And address the end user's needs and be empathetic with the experience that's going to be built to satisfy those needs. So consider a few questions while you immerse in the user experience that you intend to build. One is, you know, who is the end user? What is their persona? And how are they going to be interacting with what you're building? Is this going to be a mobile application? Is this going to be a website? Or is there going to be a report that's delivered to their inbox every morning? What are the service level agreements that you're going to be establishing with the end user to make sure it's a good experience? Now, the user, the end user, is not the only 
user that's part of this integration. There's the developer experience as well. So consider which of the Salesforce clouds and other systems are going to be part of this integration. What is the source of data and what is the journey that that data is going to travel throughout this process? What's the shape of the data? Um, what is the format of the data? Um, all these questions will, should you provide answers to them, really set the stage for where in the landscape of APIs you're going to focus your attention. And it's worth uh, calling out that you know, this point of criteria is not just for API consumption, but also building new APIs. There was a, a time a few years ago where I was building a new API with a team to replace an old rickety batch process that would query a bunch of records from a database and dump them to a CSV file for consumers to pick up should they make it through the firewall. Um, it was built many years ago, and it served our needs fine, but as our company grew and we scaled up and the consumers of this data grew, we needed to come up with a better solution. And so we were establishing a new API program, and the simplicity of this use case lent itself nicely to start building our own RESTful API. And so that was, that's what we did. We really focused on reimagining the business logic that was in this query and standing it up in this new framework that the company had provisioned. But what we didn't spend enough time thinking through was the end user experience. We were really focused on replicating that logic. And when we put the API into the hands of the consumers, it was working fine for them. They were able to build client integrations that would paginate through this data and do so in a synchronous manner. But when we opened up the set of use cases for more catalogs of information, the size grew, the number of consumers grew, we ended up encountering a lot of timeouts. And we had to, instead of focusing the product team on building new capabilities, we had to do a lot of troubleshooting. Now, we ended up getting some good feedback from our users, and we extended the features to better satisfy those needs and tamper down the problems. But if we had spent some time thinking about the user experience, we probably would have built and designed uh, a better solution. I really wish that we could have done bulk, but I just hadn't gotten that experience yet. So We hadn't met. No. So a better plan would have helped uh, deliver a better experience in that example. On top of user experience, keeping in mind what are the objects and the records you're working with is really important to understanding which API you'd want to use. Is the API you want to use, does it even support that object, right, or the specific customizations? Is it just accounts? Are you using accounts related to some type of custom object? How does that actually impact your client-side implementation? If I'm always creating an account, and then there's always going to be a related contact behind it, Am I going to be making two API calls, one after the other? Could there ever be a case where if the account fails, would I still create that contact? Do I want to manage that logic on the client side? Maybe there's an API that understands that could be an issue, and we can do rollbacks if some type of error occurred. So the inherent relationship between these objects is really important to think about as well. Then when you have that sorted out, um, it's time to focus on the operations uh, that will be executed against these objects and records. Which of the salad of operations in this cloud um, are going to come into the picture? And against which specific objects? Are they uniform? Is this a common operation going to be applied to all the objects in your uh, integration? Or are you going to be doing different things with different objects at different points along the way? Are you going to be doing a one-shot um, execution of these operations, or is this going to be an ongoing process? Um, how are the objects and records being acquired and prepared for these operations to constitute that end-to-end -end workflow? And then, most importantly, well, it's all pretty important, I think, but um, how many records are you going to be dealing with in any given time over uh, the period that will constitute that SLA? Uh, when you map out all of these um, considerations, you're going to establish your business logic. How much code are you going to have to write that's going to consume these APIs? Well, it's worth taking a step back once you have 
these questions answered to think about, is there an API that does what I'm trying to do already out of the box? And we saw that the API landscape for Salesforce is quite extensive. There are a lot of operations that are supported, so it's worth taking the time to investigate what existing capability is out there so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and write more code than you have to. Growth and scale is an interesting one because you could even answer all these questions for your now. You could have an API that's perfectly custom to your use case now, but what about the future? Will your client, will your implementation be future-proof? The number of records you could have today could be very small compared to a year from now, and will the same API support that use case? For example, if you're working with, let's say, 100 records and you're querying them, you could use the REST API and the query REST API, and you get back up to 2,000 records. But let's say then your client doesn't, has an assumption that the, all the records are gonna be returned in that first call. What happens if you go beyond the 2,000 records where you have to paginate? These, that's just a simple example. But thinking about that on a bigger scale, you could be having a growing number of accounts every month. Your business is growing, hopefully. <laughs> so those are some of the things you'd have to think about. And lastly, limits. How many resources are your resources going to be using? This is very much related to the current and future volume of records, as well as the SLA for the execution of those operations. Uh, limits, as we all know, are in place to ensure optimal performance for all customers and to provide fair access to system resources. Now, each org is only able to handle so many uh, API requests in a given 24-hour period, so it's important to consider uh, your API request budget when setting out to build a new integration. Now, at the platform integration tools booth down in uh, the first floor, we decided to use the composite API as part of the end-to-end -end workflow in order to simplify the code that we had to write while preparing the demo, but also to keep the org's request limits in check because we expect a lot of traffic to come to our demo booth. So please come see Iman and I at the Platform Integration Tools demo booth. Um, so that was a choice that we made when we thought about uh, the impact of limits on the org that would, we would be executing our demo against. So you have to make sure you think about not just the integration that you're building, but the other integrations that are happening against that org. How often or how close are you coming to reaching that API limit threshold? And for the APIs that you have in your consideration set, what is their limits um, makeup? What is unique to those APIs that you have to conform to and be ready to uh, execute against with your operations? Okay, an example scenario. Let's try to put this into practice a bit. So the scenario is gonna be, we're extracting all the objects of a specific type in our org every single day, and then we're gonna be performing some type of mutation on them. But primarily it's the extraction phase we're concerned about. So let's look at the first pillar, user experience. What is the scenario? So right now, like I'd mentioned, we're extracting that result set every single night, and then we're running a routine to score them. So what are the options that we have? We have SQL query in REST, we have it in SOAP, we have Salesforce CLI. Now what are the objects? In this case, let's say it's the account object. Once again, we can actually, and in this case, the API options, when we say REST++, there's a number of different ways you can do it in REST. There could be the composite API, or the REST query API, there's actually both, which is, relies in our standard REST framework, and then Salesforce CLI as well, which calls into those. It's another way you can do it. Now the operations. So we're querying all the records in our org, and how many are there, right? That's a very important question. So in this case, it's 10 million plus, which already has us looking in a certain direction. SOAP and REST has query more, so we're gonna be getting 2,000 records at a time synchronously. Maybe if we're talking 10 million, we're not inclined to look in that direction as much. Seems bulky, right? By bulky, I mean bulk API. And then growth in scale. Not only do we have 10 million records, but every single month we're adding about 5,000 more accounts. So that was the previous pillar we were talking about, making sure we're future-proof. And with pagination, if we're having 5,000 more, that's over two pages every month. 
What is the SLA? How quickly do we want to get this job done? And finally, limits. Oh, we already noticed that 10% of our daily request limits being used by other services. This isn't the only thing we're doing, except that's a shared limit. Query more counts toward each one of those operations. So what is our ideal choice in this scenario? It seems like it's bulk. You go ST, bulk API. Uh, actually, I can actually I, go like through to, yeah. this use case. All right. Yeah, demo would be fun. All right. Let me jump into it. So I'm going to use the bulk API to perform this extraction of account records from the org. Now, we scaled it down uh, from 10 million to make sure that we're able to succeed in this demonstration. So the first thing I need to do is perform a login against the SOAP API. So I'm going to log in and get a session ID. and place it into this Postman client so I can make requests without having to copy and paste all throughout my successive requests. So I've set this environment variable, and now I'm going to begin the workflow of creating a query job. So I need to grab this XML, which has the information I need to submit to create this job. Sending it, I got a job ID back, and now I need to inform the job what I want to query. So I'm going to paste in the job ID that I just got back and submit the details of this query, which is very simple, select ID from account. So that works well. I added it to an initial batch, and the state of this job is now queued up. So now I'm gonna close the job. There's another XML file here that indicates the state of the job that I want to establish. Oh, I need to paste the job ID in. So now that creation, submission of the query, and closing of the job workflow is complete. We've already processed a pretty hefty result set in a pretty short amount of time. So now I'm going to check how many batches contain those results. So I hit a different endpoint um, for this query job, and I see I have three different batches of records. So I'm going to take a first batch ID. Oh, I don't want that one, I need the second one. Iman reminded me of that earlier and I forgot. So here's my second batch. This is one that has records. The state of this batch is completed. So now I need to hit the result endpoint. And I find that I've got that, eight different result sets that I need to paginate through. So I access the first one, and here I have all my results. If I go back oh, wait. and I grab, yeah, Are what's you up? Are you, gonna do, are you gonna keep doing that? Like, you just, you said there were three batches, and then there's eight result sets in the first batch? Yeah. So what, are you gonna go back and do it for all the that's result the, sets? That's the workflow. Yeah, but this is, a, this is like a 40 minute breakout session. We don't have all, we don't have all morning. Fair we, enough, you have a better way? Well, did you know that we actually have version two of the same API? That's supposed to actually help with a lot of these things. Do you I, mind if I? I'm the product manager of the team, but I, I do know that, yes. Oh, okay, okay. But I just had this Postman collection already set up. Oh, got it. Well, I actually have a demo set up. All here. right. Do you mind if I? Please, okay. take it away. Okay, awesome. So actually, there's version two of the API that just went GA, uh, bulk query. And there are a couple of key takeaways we wanted to uh, provide the clients with. Primarily, if you'd noticed, this concept of batches, it's important that we break up that whole job into smaller portions, smaller components, but in V1 that was directly exposed to you all as the client. So actually it would be shown in the endpoint and it would impact your result 
retrieval experience. You have to go to these different batches, different result sets. So we said, no more batches. There shouldn't be any more. You won't see it in the ORI. It's completely abstracted away from you. So because of that, you can get all your results in a single endpoint. Hopefully that means a quicker demo. Two, creating and running the job is a single process now. In the past, Chris was showing these XML files you had to upload in multiple different steps. What if it's just one step? What if it's just a JSON string? You give us your query string. The minute you post it, we start processing. Now, we didn't touch up on this on the first part of the demo, but for those that know PK chunking, it's an optional parameter you can specify in your job that allows for parallelism and chunking so that your long running jobs where you're querying millions and millions of records could run a lot faster. You don't need to deal with that anymore. Now, we'll be able to understand your query and understand if that's even possible to do, and we'll run it automatically. And that also won't impact your result retrieval side, for those that are familiar in V1. And finally, a little extra, is that you can actually see all the jobs in your org through the API as well. In the past, you had to actually go to the setup page and look in the actual UI to see anything about your job. Now your API can see it as well. On the right, it's just kind of highlighting at a high level a much simpler experience on the bottom half versus the top half with V1. So let's actually dive into a demo. I'm magically gonna just close my eyes and Firefox. hope that there is a demo on this machine. Is it in Safari? Firefox. Firefox. Okay, great. So I'm using Jupyter Notebooks here, which for those that aren't familiar with it, it's a way that you can build Python clients and I'm actually using it because it lets you break up your client into separate chunks, separate steps. So for demo purposes, it's a little easier to, to walk through. So in this case, since I'm using Python, I wanna import some of the packages that will be required to make some REST requests. And from there, I've already authenticated and got my session using my username and password, so just trust me here, it's gonna work. Um, and on top of that, this is the actual endpoint to the server that's gonna be, we're gonna be making calls against. So before we jump into bulk, I know I kept talking about REST and this query and pagination. So if someone wants to just see what that, what that experience is like, I'll just quickly dive into that. So what happens here is we make a call to the query endpoint. It's just services data, that's our standard REST framework. Then there's a query endpoint inside, and what do we get back? So we get back a 200 status code. It says 200,000 records is the total size, but that doesn't mean that this response has 200,000 records. Done is false, which means, okay, there's still more records. And the next record's URL has an offset of 2,000, which shows us we're getting 2,000 records at a time. If you wanna get the next 2,000, you actually have to feed that back into the API, and here are the records. So hopefully that, that ties what we were talking about earlier together. But V2 query, let's jump in and show you, oh, it's a very, Normally, I'm just able to scroll past all this. Okay, great. So, with that, with V2, another great thing is that it's in our standard REST framework. So that's in the services slash data slash version, and we went J with this in version 47 of the API. 46, you're gonna get a 404, so just heads up. Here's our query, select ID from account, and we're just gonna have a simple JSON payload with an operation either being query or query all. Can you see that, or do you want me to zoom in? It's good? All right. Um, if you query all, then you can actually query for the deleted records in your org, and then the query is just a query string. So let's go ahead and submit it. All right, we get a 200 status code. We're already starting to process. The job's been marked upload complete. Here's the job ID. I wanna copy that. And then if you wanna check this, the job progress, we're gonna keep pulling the job to just see what state it's in right now. And let's see if I just keep Talking, hopefully the job is done at this point. Let us actually see. Oh, it is in progress. Um, it will be complete if I run it one more time. And so here's what we get. Here's some more of the info. We get the ID, we get the total number of records that have been processed. The total number of account records in our org is 200,000. So I'll run it one more time. Okay, job complete. We got 200,000 records and there's this notion of retries based on how large the job is. We've modified some config values for the purposes of this demo. So now let's get to the heart of it, which is the retrieving results, which is unfortunately the reason I had to jump in. I understand. Um, so here, we just actually, let's take that job ID and let's paste it right here and let's go to just slash results. 
There's no more batches anymore. What does that give us if we do a get on that endpoint? Does that give us all the data? Is it too good to be true? Okay, we get a 200 and we get all the IDs, but is this all the IDs? How do we know? So let's actually look at the result headers. Let's take a look at not only just the data that we got back, but the actual headers. If we run that, we're gonna see two new result headers specific to this API. S-Force number of records and S-Force locator. So S-Force number of records is the server saying, all right, this is the number of records I know I'm giving you. And then S-Force locator tells you whether or not you've actually have all the data. In this case, it's not null. So it's 16,000, which means this page size, in this case, is 16,000 records. So to get the next set of records, we actually grab that value and feed it in to this new locator pagination parameter. It's an optional parameter you can add to your results endpoint. Now let me just get the ID. And if you run this, okay, you get more records, but is that all? No, now we're at 32,000. So you can see the process um, happening, and there's no notion of batches, so you're still just making a call back and forth to a single endpoint. But what if you want more? What if even that's not enough? What if you want the control to dictate how many records you get back? What if you have a slower connection, and let's say in 16,000 in this case is too much, you wanna turn that down? Or you want all the records in a single shot. 200,000, I can handle that, no big, no big deal. So now there's this max records pagination parameter that allows you to override that value. And in this case, I know the job to have 200,000 records, so I'm just gonna put it there, and let's see if we can get all the records in a single call. Dun, 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 dun. All right, we got a 200, but is this all the records? Are we sure? Let's just do a final check. We check here, the S-Force locator is null, and the number of records is 200,000. We have all our records in a single call. And then finally, these jobs can be, and the results can be stored up to seven days. But if you want to delete those records earlier, you can actually just do a delete on the job ID endpoint. And when it's done, you get a 204. Sorry for the jump in, I think I'll pass back. I think it was well worth it. Don't yeah. you think so, everyone? Yeah. Thank you, Iman. Okay. Okay, so in summary, uh, we provided a framework for everyone to enhance their application lifecycle management process to choose the right API or the right APIs for the right job. We then exercise that framework for example scenario, and that exercise led us to the bulk API. And through better planning and research, uh, we were able to arrive upon the newly generally available bulk API 2.0 query, which has a much simpler workflow and improved limits consumption to perform an operation of extracting a large amount of data from your org. Ooh. But what are we working on next? What are we? So like Chris had mentioned, we just went GA with bulk v2 query and we have a very rich and fun roadmap ahead for all of you, which is alluding to the slide I said at the beginning. Please reach out to Chris if you want to participate in our mass operations pilot, which is happening right now. In spring 20, we're looking to bring enhanced limits. That doesn't necessarily just mean we're increasing your limits. It's actually flexible limits that we'll be happy to talk about more. And also reach out to Chris in the future if you would like to be part of our composite graph API that allows you to create and post uh, synthetic graphs to do CRUD on a number of different objects in your org in both the synchronous and asynchronous flavor. So with bulk API, we're actually create that's an umbrella API that will actually be able to support other bulk work workflows, such as the composite graph. So while we're working on enhancing the API landscape with new capability, we're also looking at managing our legacy API versions. So we recently announced that we're going to be retiring 14 versions of the Enterprise API in the summer 21 release, not this upcoming summer, but the year after that. Uh, the reason for this is that we wanna focus our efforts on building new API capability, encourage everyone to adopt these new capabilities that provide more features, better performance, better security. 
And we want to get this message out early so that customers and partners have adequate time to plan and revise their API consumption. Very, very few API requests uh, are being made by either orgs or against um, the totality of volume that uh, are with these impacted API versions. So we want to get this message out and encourage everyone to uh, consume more recent and current versions of the API and take advantage of the bulk query uh, 2.0 capability that just launched in winter 20. So that concludes our presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please take it to Chatter via this uh, URL. You can also scan the QR code. We'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to uh, see if you'd like to join any of our pilots and answer any questions that you have. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.